Hi. Like everyone else nowadays, I live on the internet. So I've been persuaded to check out the latest popular show, Squid Game. I don't consume a ton of the newest media, and I don't have a Netflix account, so I have to think the internet, and all its takes, from the informed to the hilarious, for persuading me to watch this show. If you say, I'm late to the party, well, you're right, but then, isn't that the fashion? Squid Game is a critique of capitalism, so you know something had to be said. Expect spoilers. I'll minimize the blood. To save time, I won't recap Squid Game. If you didn't know the message of the series was about capitalism, well, don't take my word for it. What does writer and director Huang Donghyuk say? I wanted to write a story that was an allegory or fable about modern capitalist society, something that depicts an extreme competition, somewhat like the extreme competition of life. The show is motivated by a simple idea. We're fighting for our lives in very unequal circumstances. This is a story about losers, those who struggle through the challenges of everyday life and get left behind, while the winners level up. I wanted to create something that would resonate not just for Korean people, but globally. This was my dream. We're living in a squid game world. Remember a few years ago when this rich douchebag said 3.5 billion people in poverty was good? And this is a great thing because it inspires everybody, gets the motivation to look up to the 1% and say, I want to become one of those people. I'm going to fight hard to get up to the top. He meant there would be 3.5 billion more people for the Squid Game. The players in the Squid Game are all in debt. So in debt, they let people beat them up for money. Desperate people make the best workers, because they'll do anything to keep their jobs. Why do so many people end up in debt? Well, capitalism places all kinds of financial obligations on us. We have to take care of ourselves and others, for example, which means we need to have enough money for everything we need every day for our whole lives. And if we don't have enough money, we can either break the law or fail to meet our obligations. Some people get judged for being poor, as if it were their fault, as if the world hadn't taken everything from them already. Perhaps they lost their only source of income. Perhaps they have two sources of income and still can't make ends meet. They might be suffering mental or physical illness. Or maybe they were teetering on the brink of ruin and an emergency pushed them over the edge into bankruptcy. So they've suffered the stress and the poverty and the shame of capitalism, and they still have to compete. They're its victims, like three and a half billion others. The island is the capitalist system, and each game is like a job. That's why, even if you didn't realize Squid Game was about capitalism, it might still ring true to you. They sleep in a dormitory, like millions of workers around the world and follow strict schedules. There's no way out of the game. <laughs> just as there's no apparent way out of the capitalist system if you're just a wage laborer. Just like the state imposes capitalism on us through laws and money, the guards and the front man force you to play the games. You're here, so you play until you die. But maybe I'm wrong. The guards and the front man use words like fair, voluntary, and democratic when explaining the rules. Do those words apply? 
모두에게 공정한 게임을 위해서 게임 정보는 사전에 공개할 수 없습니다. Wait, why is that fair? Was it fair to kidnap them? Is it fair to withhold the fact that if they mess up, they die? How can we talk about fairness when there's such an obvious power imbalance? All states nowadays use words like freedom and democracy while pointing guns at you. When they say the game is fair, they mean for one class of people, the players or the workers, winning is about luck. The players are going to face uncertainty, pressure, and the terror that if they screw up, their lives could end, which is how workers experience the labor market. It might be fair for those actually playing the game, but why do they have to play the game at all? They would obviously be better off if they weren't forced to engage in the fictional squid game or its real-life counterpart, capitalism. In the same vein, the squid party bosses talk about consent. They say that by signing the contract or coming back, the players consented. But it's not consent if you're not told what you're consenting to. Least of all if you get kidnapped and threatened with death. They signed a contract, right? Well, would it be consensual if you signed a form agreeing to play Russian roulette with a loaded gun because I led you to believe if it, it was just a toy? Hey, you said you would play. You signed a form, so we can do whatever we want to you. Or you came back, so that's consent. Life was made so shitty by people like the host and the VIPs who control everything that conditions forced hundreds of people every year to come back to a game they knew would probably kill them. Is that consent? When conditions engineered by other people give you no choice but to sign your life away? That's how corrupted words can get. Consent no longer requires consent. We're always being told we've given our consent to all kinds of things we've never been asked about, like being ruled by other people or being forced to use money. That's why I think playing the games is analogous to having a job. We get told we consented to work because we signed the form saying we would. Except we didn't consent to this economic system, which compels us to get jobs unless we already have money. So of course we'll sign any forms, sign away our time, our health, our freedom, and our lives. We're desperate. We don't have choice. We have the illusion of choice. You can do whatever you want. Within the rules to which you didn't consent, laid down for you by people who have power over you. This is capitalism. This is the market. This is the state. This is how power works. Not only does power force you to work for its own benefit, it tells you everything is equal and consensual and democratic, and most people believe it. Sure, I signed a contract, but I was under duress. If I didn't sign, I might have plunged myself and anyone who depends on me into poverty. I've made lots of videos on so-called democracy you can watch, but to put it simply, how could it be democratic if someone else decided on the rules and forced you to play? Doesn't democracy mean the people are in charge somehow? But then we tend to have very low standards for what we call democracy. We look at oligarchic states like the US and the UK and call them democracies and feel superior if we come from there because there's a vote every few years. Even though most people have no say in the writing or passing of legislation, as long as there is a popular vote at some point, people will continue to believe all the myths they've been taught about democracy. It says nothing for the state's so-called democracy. In Squid Game, there's a vote clause in the rules. A majority vote can end the game. It's written down, so it's a constitutional right. So players raised on propaganda might agree the system is democratic. Words like consent and democracy lose virtually all meaning in the mouth of power. After all, they, they call the whole thing a game. Game? It's a death camp. That's the kind of confusion that happens when your rulers decide what words mean. The games use the same empty rhetoric as capitalism to legitimize themselves. 
The propaganda says capitalism is fair and treats everyone as equals on an equal playing field, which is what the front man tells them. So the system must treat everyone fairly and not discriminate. In Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman famously makes roughly the same claim. That the market, the free, a true free market anyway, protects people from being discriminated against in their economic activities for reasons that are irrelevant to their productivity. So he implied that uh, any firm that discriminates on the basis of race, gender, ideology, or other attribute unrelated to worker performance imposes a cost on itself, and thus the owners would eventually be driven out of business by firms that don't discriminate. Great theory! It's why race and gender totally don't make life harder at every stage. Hearing that kind of thing every day from an authority ingrains it into your worldview, regardless of whether it's based on facts. To me, the honeycomb game symbolized the uneven playing field of capitalism pretty well. The players have to cut very different shapes out of a honeycomb, whether they're easy shapes like a triangle, or much harder shapes like an umbrella. They don't know at the start that if you pick a harder shape, you have a much greater chance of failing. The bridge game might represent it even better. The low numbers have a much lower chance of surviving due to something they were unaware of. The people running the game call that fairness. Not everyone can compete on the same level. If you get dealt a bad hand in life, like you're disabled, or trans, or black in an inaccessible, trans-misogynistic, white supremacist system, the game is much harder. Like workers, contestants follow every rule and every order, or they get fired, living in terror of making a mistake and losing their income, which is represented in Squid Game by death. It's not even a metaphor. We die of work under capitalism, too. Workers die on the job every day, whether from accident or dropping dead from stress. Or if they don't have jobs, they die from poverty instead. Also like the workers, the players live and die by the clock. I noticed an interesting symbolism regarding clocks. In episode two, we get a glimpse inside Gihun's ex-wife's home where she's living with his kids and her wealthy husband. Look at the clock. There's no second hand. It doesn't look like it's moving at all. If you have enough money or freedom, time is merely a number on the wall. At work, meanwhile, time is your master, even when your deadline is arbitrary. Everyone is assigned a number and referred to by that number, which dehumanizes them and makes them easier to dispose of. After all, to an owner or an investor, workers are infinitely disposable and replaceable. Who cares if they have their own lives and dreams? They exist only for the benefit of and at the mercy of people with power. People become only a means to an end. And some capitalists have consciences, but capitalism incentivizes, even necessitates, treating workers like machines. But hey, don't you remember that time when your boss threw you a pizza party to thank you for the sacrifice and the effort you've made? So it's all good. Gihun used to work. He did what he'd been told to all his life. But the system still treated him like shit and forced him out, into poverty and gambling addiction. He's forced to take bigger and bigger risks until he finds himself fighting for his life. In a capitalist society, anyone can find themselves in Gihun's position at any time. Gihun is haunted by the memory of a strike he was in, where the police beat the striking workers and killed one, which incidentally was based on a real incident at Sangyong Motor. The guards in Squid Game end up pinning Gihun down as well, in the same way, as if to say, your head will be under our boots, whichever job you choose. The constant stress and tension players or employees experience, don't leave when you go home after work. They affect your health and your relationships. They make it harder to relax and sleep and enjoy life outside work. But that's what happens when you're competing to survive. 
Even if I win the game, my body will be cut to shreds. And I'll be traumatized after witnessing and surviving mass murder. I might even feel guilty that I didn't help them more or die in their place. How do you even live your life after that? And even if your body and mind are in tatters, the boss will still expect you to come to work. Capitalism sets us up to compete against each other for jobs, promotions, raises, and recognition. Many wealthy people believe nature is a constant struggle of the individual to survive, a winner-take-all contest to determine the winner of, uh, whatever game they think they're playing. So it's not surprising the games are all about the so-called survival of the fittest. Not everyone can get rich. Capitalism empowers a tiny percentage of well-connected people to make more money than they could possibly spend by owning the fruits of other people's labor. If one of us gets out of poverty, we'll probably do it by using other people somehow. Capitalism turns us all into crabs in a bucket. The only way one crab can get out is by standing on all the others. So people are born into wealth created by slaves and then tell themselves they deserve it for winning a competition the rest of us never signed up for. The game I'm most fond of is the glass stepping stones, says Huang. The person behind is able to move forward because the person in front of them died crossing the bridge. What I wanted to express there was the idea that we should remember the losers and the fact that the winners in our society are symbolically standing on the bodies of the defeat. The bridge game somehow feels like a trolley problem to me. If the people in front of you were probably going to die anyway, and time is running out for you to survive, why not push them? They're just another crab that isn't you. Moreover, you can be sure the biggest assholes, the dotsus of the game, will push people to their deaths without a second thought. When you have to step on other people, it corrupts you. It forces you to break connections you've made with others, compete with people you thought were on your side, and stab them in the back. Trust and friendship are nearly impossible in such a situation, so it's everyone for themselves. Sang-woo wasn't some ruthless killer when he went into the game. He was turned into a killer by the game. And why not? That's the whole purpose of the game. He was just playing it the way you're supposed to play it. Yeah, I killed those people, or destroyed that forest, or split up that family. My boss told me to. I'm just doing my job. Gotta pay the bills. Great example of the corrupting influence of institutions. Institutions create circumstances, incentives, and limits, and they influence our behavior far more than we're aware. People in Squid Game talk about Good and bad people, or if humanity is good? But what do those words even mean in such a restrictive system? What does it mean to speak of humanity if the only humans we know come from cultures ruled by states and empires for centuries? The circumstances we experience are extremely unusual and specific to our time. You know, like being put in a giant game simulation. We can hardly understand the full range of human nature simply by observing how people act when forced into a situation of strict boundaries, arbitrary rules, pointless activities, and artificial scarcity, and told to compete to the death. Oilnam, player one, thinks like millions of people raised in a competitive system. People aren't so good. No one's helping the homeless man outside the window. Well, maybe more would be able to help if they weren't busy working for people like you, 
or sleeping off a 12-hour workday, or crippled by stress and anxiety. Maybe if states had not long ago crushed our sense of community, that man would never have wound up on the street in the first place. It's usually meaningless and arbitrary to divide people into good and bad people without taking into account the effects of the systems that surround them, systems held together by people with guns. You do what the system expects of you, however much it harms you, or else you don't make it through the game alive. But even if capitalism doesn't corrupt you, it still burdens you with intractable obligations. Sebio couldn't save her mother despite her struggle. People who look down on the poor might say, oh well, she just didn't work hard enough in life, or didn't take the opportunities she was given by this benign system. And anyway, she was a thief. She violated the sacred right of property just to survive. And so obviously she deserved to be punished. Right, Milton? Gihun sacrificed everything to save his mother too. But he was too late. He was out hustling to get money to keep his family alive, like billions of people around the world living under an empire of capital. He was too busy at work to be there when his mother died. Wins and losses in Squid Game are individual. That's because struggles under capitalism are individual. We're expected to take care of ourselves and our families only. If others are struggling, that's not my problem. What was the point of red light, green light? You know, let the workers do the work and take the risks. Capitalism creates problems, then tells us to deal with them as individuals, even though we have the same problems and they come from the same source. In episode two, right before the vote on whether or not to end the game, the guards remind everyone of the enormous amount of money tantalizingly floating above their heads. Capitalism does this too. It says, you can get rich. You can only get rich by surviving. And you can only survive if 200 other people die. But the money would solve some of your individual problems. It would benefit everyone a little if that money was simply distributed to all the contestants, but that's not what's on offer. Only a tiny minority can get rich. The others get stepped on. As another Korean filmmaker put it, it's not just about economic woes and the polarization of the classes. Yes, it's that, but there's also an extreme kind of shame associated with being poor and being a failure to the family and to the community. And that's why so many people are not having children, which is basically as cynical and dystopian as you can get. Shame is individual, too. Even if you're facing the same troubles as everyone else for the same reasons, you were told you were different and would be successful. From a systemic point of view, your poverty or oppression has nothing to do with you. These conditions were imposed on you. But then why do so many people look down on the poor? Because instead of considering systems or asking people why they're poor, they uncritically repeat the propaganda about poor people just being lazy. In this way, shame can be a tool of the powerful to keep you going back to work. Even Gihon's sick elderly mother refuses to let her illness stand in the way of the endless struggle to keep their heads above water. And when there's no more spirit in you, you give up. Instead of competing under capitalism, many people are driven to despair and depression. They realize there's no hope, no future, but a dystopian maze of confused people trying to screw others over to survive. The character of Ji Young is emblematic of such people. <laughs> Yeah, 
좀 생각을 해봤거든. 아무리 생각해도 생각이 안 나. She realized she had one chance to give her life meaning, to sacrifice it for someone else. Some descriptions of the show say the contestants are from all walks of life. But are they? They're from a lot of walks of life, but you may have noticed none of the players is rich. No one there makes a living by owning things or getting others to work for them. The wealthy don't have to participate in the game. They run the game. And as soon as it looks like you might have an advantage, they change the rules. Yeah, number 13 definitely sees something that the others can't. I think he's examining the refraction of the light. Let me adjust the settings. You know, like, if there was this way for regular people to make money the way rich people do, but they shut it down? All states structure society and regularly intervene to use violence in the way that best benefits the people who control the state, usually the rich. The rich make everything cost money by taking ownership of things and then charging money to use them. And along with laws and taxes, that's how the state forces us to use money. Since only a small minority controls most of the money, those of us who don't own things have to work. There's this misconception that having money just means you can do whatever you want with your own life. But in reality, because they control the means of violence, like laws and police, the rich control your life, too. They have the power of life or death over you, and face no consequences. The ruling class and everyone who believes it's propaganda will naturally use words like fair and democracy to describe their rule. In episode 2, the agent of the rulers tells the players, they can't use honest language to describe what they're doing, or the players would know the truth about their situation. They have to present themselves as benefactors, here to help you pay off your debt you owe to someone else. <laughs> right, just a game, and capitalism is just freedom. As bad as it is to follow other people's orders all day, the only thing in a capitalist system worse than having a job is not having a job. Episode 2 is called Hell, and it doesn't even take place in the game. It's just participants trying to go back in the real world and survive with all their burdens. They leave the game, but they're so desperate in the real world, being unemployed, as it were, that they're compelled to try again. Hell is unemployment. To get out of hell, it makes sense to them to risk everything they have on the slim chance it'll solve their problems. Perhaps that's why Oil Nam votes to end the game. He wants everyone to come back motivated. You know about divide and conquer. Did you see how they did it in Squid Game? Racism is a great method to divide people. <laughs> Some people see racism as in their interest. It's easier to step on someone if you look down on them. Sebyok's character shows us the divisive nature of borders, which killed her father and imprisoned her mother. But I think episode 4 gives the starkest examples of divide and conquer. First, there's artificial scarcity. Later we learn giving them too little was deliberate, calculated so some would go without and they would fight with each other. The players went through the whole process of redressing grievances, you know, asking the people holding you by the throat if they wouldn't mind making things fair. But when you appeal to bosses or the state to do something against their interest, you have no chance. After receiving the usual response to their petition, 
The next step, as you could predict, is for the downtrodden to fight amongst themselves. Their problems have the same cause, the game, the system that surrounds them and its agents. They would know who the real enemy was if they thought about it, but most people either think they have no chance of fighting the power, or else are too distracted by enemies of more immediate importance, like the guy who stole your lunch. It wasn't even much of a lunch. An egg and a soda? But when that's all you've got, you'll fight for it. Let's bear in mind, the guards could easily stop the violence. They are ordered not to. The triangles come in pointing their guns and the fighting would stop pretty fast. But instead, bullying and violence are tolerated and encouraged, as long as it doesn't interfere with the game. <laughs> Just like in real life. Standing by as right-wing gangs attack people is a common role of the police. Right-wing protests and violence throughout history have often been tolerated, protected, aided, and even populated by the police. While black and brown people or LGBTQ people get the sticks and the dogs and the tear gas. The one positive here is our protagonists learn the value of solidarity sticking together to defend each other as equals. As such, the guards represent the police. They are the people who follow the orders of the ruling class to use violence against the rest. Their power over players affords them a few minor privileges, like being less likely to get killed. Some of the guards were secretly harvesting the organs of dead participants and selling them off. The front man doesn't even care like a police chief might turn a blind eye to cops selling drugs they've confiscated. But still, the guards have no freedom. They, too, follow strict rules and patterns and rigid hierarchies, and also get killed when they break them. The relatively senior guards even monitor all the others, constantly, because, hey, it's a workplace. I wonder if the guards, too, were also desperate for money. Because that would also mirror the real world. The poor controlling and killing the poor in return for slightly better conditions. On the subject of police, it seems naive the way some contestants, and of course the cop character, appeal to the law. <laughs> Do you really think the people who had the resources to create this whole system are subject to the law? That you, the powerless, the poor, the object of power, could use their system against them? Just because you've been told you're equal before the law doesn't mean the law is on your side. Just because everyone calls it a democracy does not mean you're in charge. We also need to talk about the VIPs. Obviously, they represent really rich people. One effect of amassing wealth and power is you can do almost anything you want and people will indulge you. So they get used to taking what they want from whom they want, including life. These people, like the host, are so corrupted by a life at the top, they don't feel bad about doing whatever they want to other people. They want to appear benevolent, so they talk about generously giving the players opportunities. When this is the class of people who engineered conditions so millions of people would be desperate for money. Opportunities? They already stole your opportunities. All they left was wage labor. You may also have noticed the VIPs are all white men. What could that mean, do you think? Well, unless I'm way off, I'm guessing it alludes to global white supremacy, US political influence in Asia, and the fact that most of the richest people in the world are white men. The hierarchy of Squid Game puts poor Koreans at the bottom, then relatively wealthy Koreans giving orders in the middle, 
who are working for the wealthy white people at the top. Do you think that might be Hwang Dong-hyuk's nutshell description of the Korean economy? Either way, at the beginning of the games, like in our time, there are a lot more people than cops and bosses. And if the players hadn't been tricked into participating, but had the truth, they might have overpowered the guards. But sometimes it's hard to know when to resist. Will fighting back get you killed? Or will not fighting back get you killed? It might be better to just move to the middle of the herd. Regardless, ignorant and divided people will never organize to resist. I think Squid Game has a pretty clear message about winning and losing under capitalism. You have a slim chance of winning, but if you do, you win it all at everyone else's expense. If you lose, which is far more likely, you will continue to live a hard and stressful life of toil and misery, and you will never find your way out of it. Or you'll die. Either way, in the pursuit of success, fun is not a virtue, but a distraction. We live in a world where fun is only allowed to exist after and outside of work. The purpose of work is not to enjoy oneself, it's to make money. If your whole life is work, maybe because you can't leave, then fun is probably off the table altogether. I've said before, capitalism is even bad for the rich, because even they still need to play some form of the game and follow its onerous rules, and their only prize is money, not happiness or fulfillment. You can't buy family or friends. In fact, it might alienate you from the ones you already have. And having money doesn't stop you from dying. You just get to have more stuff while you're alive. We've been promised that if we work hard enough and follow all the rules, we can win this game of life. It's possible we'll be one of the tiny minority who get rich. What gets covered up is it costs us our lives. The pursuit of money, whether out of necessity or thirst for some kind of measurable success, as defined by capitalist propaganda, drains life of pleasure and leaves us empty. As Kim Kyung Hyun notes, we've lost, in some ways, our ability to enjoy the game. That comes with capitalism, too. Our sense of enjoyment shouldn't necessarily be about the outcome, which is, you know, how much money will I be paid? That shouldn't be it. But it is. All these games could be fun. It's just, when you're playing for your life, it's a bit stressful. I can play Monopoly for fun, but might also freeze to death in the street because I can't afford rent. Work could be fun, too. If we had more control over our own lives and had the freedom to do what we wanted, we would work at our own pace and with whom we chose, instead of flushing away our lives at a job all day. We would naturally resort to more fulfilling, less stressful work, and automate as much of the drudgery as possible. If everyone needs, everyone's needs were met, because resources were shared, we would work at what's necessary, or what we enjoy, instead of whatever corporations happen to be offering. Why would we go across town to sit in an office all day with people we don't like to make other people rich if it weren't a question of survival? It's hard for work to be fun under capitalism. There's no time for fun. Some people feel guilty for having fun, and they can never truly relax or enjoy themselves because in the back of their minds they're thinking they should be working. But surely making money isn't your only purpose in life. You might have heard how, at the end of a press conference, LeBron James said he didn't like the ending of Squid Game. Get on the flight and see your daughter, he said. That's what a father's supposed to do, right? But maybe there's a struggle even bigger than his daughter. Season 1 ends with Gihon turning back and not getting on the plane to the States. And that was in fact my way of communicating the message that you should not be dragged along by the competitive flow of society, but that you should start thinking about who's created the whole system, and whether there's some potential for you to turn back and face it. So it's not necessarily Gihon turning back to get revenge, it could actually be interpreted 
as him making a very on-the-spot eye contact with what's truly going on in the bigger picture. In other words, he decided to fight for what's right, to save others, not just pursue his own narrow interests. Let's hope he remembers one of the lessons we learned. When people work together in solidarity, they survive a lot better. I believe we can't go on living without trust in other people, unless you choose to do wrong things and go down a dark path. This is very well depicted in the lines of Gihan. Right before the nighttime battle, when he's approaching Sebyeop to join his team, Sebyeop says, I don't trust people. But to that, Gihan says, you don't trust people because you can. You trust people because you have to. Meaning, we don't have anything else to depend on. Those lines from Gihan are, in fact, exactly in line with my feelings. Many of us are put in situations where we can't really trust other people. I mean, I've been put in that situation quite often. But even though that's the case, if you don't trust other people, and you don't have trust in the humanity that's inside yourself, then there really is no answer for you as to how you're going to live. The only way to truly win at a game like Squid Game is to refuse to participate. What if... After people voted to leave in episode 2, they had banded together and created a society based on mutual aid. There are 200 of them. That's enough skills and knowledge and hands to create a whole new society, or at least to create a pocket of resistance in this one. If enough of us stand up at once, we can flip the table over. Life doesn't have to be a constant struggle. We can eliminate systems of power and take back control of our lives. In another interview, Huang Donghyo asks the viewer to consider the system they live under. After watching it, you'll start to think why the characters had to compete so hard, and that'll lead you to think, why am I living in such a competitive manner? Why do we have to compete all the time? Where did this all start, and where is this leading to? I agree, those are great questions to ask yourself. I have my own answers to all of them and other things in other videos on this channel. Subscribe and check them out. Thanks.